Without further ado, I'd like to, to introduce to the stage uh, two very good friends of Granta Magazine um, and, and mine, Colin McCann and Alexander Hemmen, who, in addition to the works that they've published, um, have been enormous supporters of uh, expanding uh, what we think about when we think about literature in this country. Um, Colm and Sasha. Hello. Hello. Good afternoon. Thank you all for coming. Yeah, it's great. Instead of walking around in a beautiful day, I take that to be a sign of commitment and interest in what we're going to talk about this afternoon. Um, I am the editor of the Best European Fiction 2010 and 2011. Colin McCann is going to write an introduction of, um, for the 2011 issue. And um, since we've known each other for a very long time, we have talked about literature a number of times and talked about the situation of translation and uh, exchange that is inherent in uh, literature. Um, John mentioned the noun, pretty well-known fact that uh, only about 3% of published uh, literary works in this country are translations. Um, not only that, but many of them are published by small university presses and often um, very small first runs, and the first run being the only run very often. And um, it is generally taken as axiomatic that the translations of books from foreign languages do not reach mainstream readership. Um, it is also, um, we also talked about, and many people have talked about, uh, the remark of uh, the member of the Swedish Nobel Committee who dismissed American um, literary culture as being um, insular and not interested in translations. Obviously, this is, you know, a response to that. But, uh, and we, that's one of the things we want to talk about. But I would like to ask Colin what he thinks about that remark and about the situation of translation in this country and, by extension, in the English language. Yeah, um, thank you. Um, it's a, it's uh, a pleasure to be here. Uh, um, yeah, this, this whole thing about 3%, um, I mean, what we have talked about in the past is um, the essential question is whose fault is it, right? So uh, the fault could be uh, laid on the floor of like numerous uh, um, uh, companies, governments, maybe even on the, on, uh, uh, upon the writers themselves, though I doubt it. Because if you look at, um, say, uh, you know, this, this book here, it's all about sort of discovering new and sometimes established voices that, um, that are there. But there, um, or is it our fault as readers? Or uh, is it the US publishers? I mean, where is this supposed insularity um, coming from? And I think that's, that, that's the essential question. But when you start to pierce it, I think, with books like this, or with uh, translations, or a festival, as John said, that invites all these world voices to come along, uh, then things start to shatter, things start to change. But um, you know, there's a little publication outside from, from the, 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 the Catalan Literature Exchange, um, and every year they do this. And, 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 and my awareness, say, of, of literature from, from uh, Catalonia is, uh, you know, uh, over the past few years, I've, I've read numerous writers, uh, including novels um, and short stories and poems, uh, because they have decided to, to sort of be active about the whole thing. I know the Irish government is fairly active about the whole thing. So uh, my question is sort of giving it back to you. Is it the US publisher's fault? Is it the uh, writers? Is it, you know, where, where do you find the ground? Well, I think, you know, the publishing industry is in huge trouble as it is, um, and many faults could be assigned to them. But I also think it's sort of wrong to think about the whole thing in terms of fault, because um, even if we determine whose fault it is, what are we going to do with them? Arrest them or beat them? You know, um, yes. it's beside the point. <laughs> well, like beating someone is always fun, of course, but um, it's, a European it's not exactly fiction, effective. But I think uh, what I like about this project and what I like um, the project of this uh, anthology, but also the project of this very festival, is that I'd rather think about things that we can do rather than things that are hard to do or can't be done. This project, um, the Best European Fiction 
uh, series, which is going to go on in perpetuity, I hope, at least for 2011 and 2012, um, is funded by foreign governments. That is, foreign governments in Europe, uh, many of them have translation funds, so cultural exchange funds, from which they can help uh, the Dalky Archive Press, who are the publisher of this anthology, generate translations from which I make selections as, as the editor. Um, for this to be possible, someone had to go, actually, and talk to those governments. Someone had to go and meet uh, the bureaucrat from Lithuania or um, England or um, you know, Finland and tell them, if you give us the money to translate this, we are going to do this. It's enormous work. What reached me was a pile of manuscript, rather, an online file, uh, about three <clears throat> submissions from each country. Um, and from these submissions, I selected uh, these things. And from 2011, um, I did the same thing. The thing about this project, and this is why this project is interesting, why the situation of some sort of format for continuous exchange is so essential, is that it generates translation. So for each uh, published um, piece, published in this anthology, the two unpublished ones have not vanished into oblivion. They are translated and available to uh, people who are interested in that. So there have been uh, inquests from agents. The translators have submitted uh, their translations of the words that have not published here um, to other publications. Um, the very project actually you know, puts food on the table of many translators. And many of them, you know, Lithuanian translators, translators do not really make a big buck, as you can imagine. Uh, so to create a situation which translation on the one hand, is a continuous activity. That there's a project that allows translation to be happening continuously, not as a one-off, but continuously. That's the thing that I like about this. And this, what in some ways, we as writers, because both of us are writers, we in some ways are familiar with this project because uh, not only as writers, but as someone, as people who come from elsewhere, that you have to constantly engage to the place where you come from, and then by extension, to you know, place the, the big place where you came from, which would be called Europe, I suppose, in many ways. Let me ask you this, because I, I, I've talked about this project many, many times. And, um, and I said this in talking about this. I've never met a writer who was only confined to his or her own language. That is, who only read books um, written in his or her own language. Every writer I've ever met, and I've met a large number of them, and if you had a survey in this festival, 3,000 or so writers, I, you would be hard-pressed to find a writer who has, not read, who has not read a book from some other language. To my mind, the project of translation is inherent in literature. Right. And I, I wonder what translations determined you as a, as a writer when you were younger and even now. What languages, what um, writers from um, other languages have influenced you and have shown you the way? You know, it was, it was, it was fun uh, when this dropped in through the door to go immediately through it and, and uh, I wanted to go right to see who uh, you were picking from, from Ireland and you have two stories from Ireland, one, in, one originally in English and then one in Irish and I thought <coughs> that's fantastic, that's exactly what we need. We need, you know, people who are, uh, you know, uh, prepared to take on uh, what, what seem to be the smaller languages and, 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 and uh, embed them uh, in the best European fiction. Because growing up, I mean, I used to read in Irish, and so a lot of, a lot of what happened to me was, was coming through uh, what was happening in school. But we'd have uh, Irish language uh, writers, then French writers, um, Zola, for instance, and Maupassant, and Zola, you know, with the social novel and his belief that, 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 that uh, the writing mattered, which is very interesting uh, to me when, when it comes to, say, this particular book, because um, so many people are talking about the fact that fiction doesn't matter anymore, um, and, what, and what does it mean in, in part of the larger culture. But I open this up and I see a story from Liechtenstein. Now, I don't know all that much about Liechtenstein, but... It's uh, rather big. It, have you been there? No. <laughs> I've seen stamps from the <laughs> yes. but, uh, no, uh, and, and you were talking about like reading the Finnish writers and you know, um, and the, 
the way that a story can operate on the ground and then spin out in, 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 other, uh, in other ways and collide uh, with American literature and we take on these voices. The, the one project about American literature that's also interesting to me is how expansive it has been in allowing others to come in and <coughs> Europeans. I mean, we do talk about the insularity, or Europeans have been talking about the insularity of American culture, but the American literary culture uh, seems to me to be very good at absorbing and welcoming people like Chimamanda uh, Ngozi Adichie, um, people like um, Yi Yun Lee, uh, people like yourself, myself, Juno Diaz. <clears throat> the idea uh, from America that I like is that you can come here, you can be part of the American literary scene, but you also hold on to your own country. Now, do you think European countries do that or achieve that as well? Well, European cultures, I think, uh, operate differently um, in that way because and their national identity is defined uh, differently. That is breaking down and, and it's causing all kinds of problems in, in right. European, European cultures uh, because, I mean, this is a, a rough generalization, but to be a German, you're required to have German blood, as it were. Uh, until very recently, there was in fact a law. You could not, the third generation Turkish immigrants were not German. <clears throat> and uh, whereas here, it's obviously not a bad thing except in some southwestern states. Uh, <laughs> but it's in, unconstitutional, obviously. And so to be uh, an American citizen, you have to, well, become a citizen in a sense, but also as long as you participate in in the culture or the society, that no one questions your bloodline. Um, you know, that's uh, one thing that has changed significantly. In Europe, because <clears throat> nation states of Europe have been organized around uh, notions of, of ethnic identity, that is, France is the country of Frenchmen, they ran into a problem because, you know, with North, America, uh, North African, I'm sorry, immigrants, are they French? Are they not French? Uh, for many French people, that is entirely confusing, including the president of France, <clears throat> but they have to sort these things out. And many of these things have been sorted out in the United States, um, you know, and we know the stories about this. And indeed, American literature has been welcoming to me, certainly personally, because as long as I write in English, I am not a second-class citizen, I mean, in literature. So, uh, but but I, I, let I, me I, ask you this. No, let me ask you, could, 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 no, could, no, could you, no, 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 <laughs> could, would, would you be in here and would, uh, uh, well, I mean, Philosophically, or could, could, could you allow yourself now to be an American writer and a European writer at the same time and hold those things as a sort of uncomplicated argument? But I am, and, uh, and for, I am in it, I mean, as, a, as the editor. I mean, in some ways, I'm written all over it. Um, there's also the, the fact that because translation is inherent in literature, that you always hyphenate as a writer. You know, I grew up reading American. Uh, writers, but also Russian writers and Eastern European writers, not only in my own language. And to me, it was, I've been thinking about this a lot, it was entirely continuous. I never, you know, if I read a book by a writer from former Yugoslavia, and then next book was an American writer, uh, a book by an American writer, or an anthology of American short story, and then a book by Chekhov, I never had a sense that I was crossing borders as I was moving from one book to another. I was always within the same territory of literature. And then translations were, you know, you would see in the first place it was a translation. But once you entered it, it was a sovereign territory of literature. I never thought that I was making a great leap into otherness where I would, you know, learn strange things about distant other cultures. It was all, <clears throat> I guess, reading in some ways operates um, um, in the reader, in a, at least in me, that you, at the same time, recognizing what is familiar to you and recognizing the common humanity but also discovering something, right? And, and what you discover, it, 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 is, uh, it belongs to uh, elsewhere. But that elsewhere could be within the same language, just as well as in, as in a foreign language. And would that beg the question, why give uh, you know, countries titles? Why say, this writer is from Liechtenstein, this writer is from Portugal, this writer is from Denmark? I think language is, uh, is, is a determining factor there, um, because people, who write in their native language, they necessarily connect to a particular tradition, not just the literary tradition, but obviously literary tradition, but also you know, the daily life of people who are using that language. One of the reasons that I write in English, write fiction in English, I write in Bosnian too, is because at some point I realized I'm going to live here. 
the language of my daily life is going to be English. If I want to engage as a writer, as a person with the daily life, I have to use English. Uh, and so people who, who are Lithuanian and write in Lithuanian, they engage with Lithuanian life on the level of language. Um, not just with that life, they might connect with Proust or New York at the same time, um, but by engaging that language and producing that language, they have, that's the, the channel that keeps them connected with the experience. Let me ask you a question. Um, an argument has been made that because people um, whose second language is English or people who come from elsewhere, who come to the United States and write in English, they sort of render the need for translations um, smaller or less, less relevant. That is, we don't need translations because we have all these foreigners writing in English. Do you think that's a valid argument to any extent? No, I, I don't think it can be valid. I mean, if you want to come, if you want to be, you know, like Conrad, if you want to be like Nebukov, if you want to be like Sasha Heeman and come over and use the language almost better than people uh, 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 use it here uh, themselves, then do it. Uh, the whole notion of, uh, you know, having a language sort of foisted upon you is particularly acute when you talk about uh, sort of Irish literature and say Joyce looking at the project of language as uh, a tool of violence, as a way to get back against imperialism, as a way to talk about colonialism, the way the Indians now are using uh, the English language sort of having had it foisted upon them and then taking it and reshaping it and saying that which w was, was put upon us now, let us use it in, in, in a new and unusual way. But I don't think that the, the, the argument for less translations is helped by the notion that um, you should just come over here and write in English. I mean, because uh, the territory of the language, the sound, say, of the Danish, the sound of uh, the French, the sound of uh, the Russian um, is so, so important to the project of the characters, the project of uh, the plot, the, the, the project of the meaning of the story. But here is the rub. We have to find and we have to be willing to fund uh, the translators to, to do this because they do an extraordinary job. I mean, I have great relationship with my French translator, great relationship with my German translator, but I can't read what they do in the end. I must trust them that they take what I've written or what you've written and make the words pop off the page in, in, in the same way. It's an enormous amount of trust. Translators are the unsung heroes of, of literature and um, you know, at large, global literature. Um, I have tremendous ex respect for translators. The translators in this book are the uh, sung heroes, I'm just singing about them. Uh, uh, because many of them, they kept translating, they keep translating pretty much out of love of uh, performing that work. They have not been paid much um, uh, for obvious reasons. And there are people who we simply need around. It is what, it's, a, it's a class of people without which the very project of literature would be entirely impossible. Can I tell you a funny story? Riley Doyle is at the, um, at the, the, the festival uh, this time around. But when he wrote the book, um, The Snapper, there's a Dublin phrase um, that goes, I'm scarlet for you. And it, just, it makes you laugh just to think, you know, if, you know, if somebody's embarrassed, you say, I'm scarlet for you. And um, the Japanese translation, when the film came out, of I'm scarlet for you was, I am socially embarrassed for your predicament. <laughs> <laughs> That's why we need good translators. But there's an argument about translations. Um, let me put it this way. Robert Frost famously said that poetry is what is lost in translation. And then uh, Joseph Brodsky said that poetry is what is gained in translation. In other words, you lose some, you gain some. What do you think we're gaining um, by being in continuous touch with, say, uh, with European literatures? What is it that we're going to get from it? Assuming that there's readerly pleasure in reading the stories in this selection and uh, future selections, that in fact there are stories that are worth reading not only because of their cultural mission, but simply because they're good stories. What is it that we're getting from it as writers, as readers, as a culture, and as a society? Uh, we gain the ability to travel, uh, to, to sit inside a body that's not ours for a little while, um, to 
go to that country without actually physically going there uh, to become part of the ideas it's a it's a project of empathy as much as uh, as much as anything else the, a translation is a leap of empathy but also the the act of reading and and engaging with that particular story is um, a sort of a privileged empathy if you will so i can go here and hop into a story um, that I wouldn't have hopped into before. So it gives me a chance to, to go somewhere entirely new and come out of it, hopefully just shifted sideways a little bit. And, and we don't do that enough. And it's true, this 3% thing is, is, is kind of ridiculous. But you know, if we continue, say, pen world voices, if we continue doing best and new European fiction and best and new African fiction and Asian fiction, we're going to become just slightly better. And you know, it's kind of funny after 45 years on the earth to, 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 to say that the most profound thing that I can say to anybody is that we need to be good to one another. <laughs> but I genuinely believe that fiction, poetry, playwriting can, can, has the ability to um, allow us to be better to one another. That's nice. I'll be better to you after this. Uh, let oh, we, me, we, we have, let me we abuse have, you a little more first. Um, what was the question? The question is this. When you were growing up in Ireland, did you feel European? Or another way to ask this question is what exactly Europe means to you? Well, uh, I grew up, we, Ireland joined the EEC in, um, in 73 and you know, all the roads came from the EEC and all that, that, that wealth that was created. Um, a lot of Irish people will, will actually call themselves Europeans now before they will um, even say that they're Irish, particularly since the economy crashed and they needed to be rescued. <laughs> um, you know, I was reading American literature uh, more than I was um, European literature uh, in my teens. I was into Kerouac and Ginsburg and Ferlinghetti and um, uh, Brodigan and people like that. Um, and uh, it was only later on that I circled back to European fiction. But in, in my own sense, I suppose I always felt Irish first. And then living here, I feel like I'm a New Yorker. Uh, as opposed to an American, right? <laughs> and so, and that's a, that, and that's a, that's a strange, uh, you know, a, a strange thing to say. It would be nice if we were able. I know we have talked about this. The embarrassment of the last, say, decade, in particular, say after 9/11, and calling oneself an American and carrying that passport. But it's moments like this that, uh, that, that allow us to sort of break out and say, well, you know what, uh, maybe it's not so, n n not so bad. You, you talked about this during the Bush years. You were embarrassed. Well, I was embarrassed because I was represented by people who you know, claimed to be working in my interest and I thought they were criminals and still do. Um, and it, it's a problem. At the same time, you can't, I, can't, I couldn't quit. I do not want to quit because if I quit, then the only ones, so to speak, not just me, the only people who are left are those who are entirely endorsing the project. So what I like about the, the American spirit, if that's the word, is that you, know, you can give up on translation, so you can give up on um, the American government and, and for someone in my situation, just move over there, wherever there is. Or you can stay in. Right. And you know, uh, there's space to stay in and, and fight for things. There's a lot of fighting space in this country, in the, in the city, in the city of, of Chicago. Um, and so, but don't you think things have changed in the last couple of years? I do think they have it changed. It really feels like things However, have changed. We have a president who reads, for one. Well, I mean, that's great. A president who can put a sentence together. That, yeah. to me, is a big deal. You know? right. just, um, I'm, I'm, I was embarrassed as a writer all along. Um, what the views of language was bad enough. I wonder, however, and this is entirely speculative, what the existence of this um, what the existence of this um, anthology would make in Europe would make people in Europe think about the United States and um, whether it undervalues the argument of um, 
insularity. Um, we will have to ask some Europeans, obviously, or full-time Europeans at least, um, whether the, the, the space that is opened by this um, anthology, this project, and the interest like, that is shown by the very existence of this festival, how that undermines the, the notion of American isolationism. Uh, well, I mean, we're going to have a, a couple of writers um, come in, coming up here. Uh, I think the answer is that this book really shouldn't be a big deal. Because uh, uh, we shouldn't even have to stand up here and, 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 and talk about how unique it is. But the fact of the matter is, I mean, it's made a big splash. I mean, there's, you know, 15,000 copies or more, you know, already sold this year, which is a lot for, for a book. There are universities taking it on their courses. I, uh, Martin was telling me earlier that uh, they're translating this book now in Europe, which is fantastic. So the Italians are taking it, you know, the Portuguese are going to take it, and then in Korea they're taking it uh, as well too. Um, so, so it shows the absolute necessity of this sort of project. The best American stories have been around for years, and Europeans have been reading them uh, for years. So I think... Um, it's interesting that this book has made such a mark over here and then it, that, it's, that it's actually uh, going back there at the same time. To me, um, I'm, I've been involved with this project. I'm very proud of it. Um, and I always thought that there was space for a book like this. But the response to it actually um, showed that I was right, that there are people. And I mean, we are here on, Sunday, on Saturday afternoon on a beautiful day. Um, and not only in the United States, but in the UK, that there's space for translation. There's a large number of readers who are interested in, in communication with European literatures. Now, this might not be a large number by, by you know, American mainstream publisher standards, not hundreds of thousands of books. But I think that part of the problem that the publishing industry has had is because they dismissed, uh, how would I put it, small groups of readers or uh, you know, small numbers. They are not publishing horizontally, but they're publishing vertically. They want mm -hmm. the 40 million copy book, right. not a book like this. And to me as a writer and as a reader, um, I want to know as much as possible, right. not just to have one book that is going to presumably explain everything to me, not that the Da Vinci Code explains anything to anyone. Yeah. See what I mean? That the, the, the field of literature needs to me, it needs to be expanded at all times. And for this, we Absolutely. have to conquer small spaces. So I want to know what's happening in Lithuania, even though, you know, um, maybe there are a few thousand people in this country who would be interested in that. But well, we need those few thousand people, people, those committed readers who are driven by curiosity and not just by need for entertainment. And, and I think you're going to take this um, series in 20 years and you'll flick through it and you will have all the Nobel winners coming along and say, oh, look at that. You know, somebody recognized her when she was 25 years old. Somebody recognized him when he was, you know, 39 years old. I, I, I plan old. to ask for a cut. Yeah, <laughs> you're going to get a cut of the book. <laughs> but, I mean, that's, that, 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 that's profound and, 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 and necessary. Um, now, uh, is there a yeah, equivalent... We have one more minute. So, okay, so one more minute. Is there an equivalent European insularity in relation to American literature? I think there is, yes. Uh, I think there is, but you have to start communicating from one end, and whoever starts first is fine. Not that we started first, but uh, the communication, is a, the cliche goes, is a two-way street. And there's a lot of interest in, in Europe for American literature. We both grew up reading a lot of American literature. Uh, but there's also a need for, a reci um, reci for reciprocity, and this is a, uh, a, a gesture of friendship. Um, let's, send, let's send cartloads over the, uh, of this over to Sweden. <laughs> that we, we will. Uh, um, yes, uh, we will. Uh, we will take a little break, and then the readers, I mean, the writers from this anthology are going to read with some introduction. They will come back for a little discussion and then um, hopefully have some questions for the audience. So bear with us for a few minutes while the stage is rearranged. And um, yeah, eat your dessert in the meantime. Thank you. back as we promised.
Hi. Hi. Uh, my name is Martin Riker. I'm with Dalkey Archive. Thanks. Uh, the, the publisher of this book. And um, I just, I don't know if you saw it, but during the break, the book was on the stage with the blue light, and it actually shines like a velvet black light poster. <laughs> and I'd never noticed that that was true of the cover, and I'm really excited about it. So, we got some photos. We had the, the pen guy got some photos. So. Um, when we set out to do the book, we wanted to do two things with it. One is that we wanted to do the sort of the, the political raising awareness, uh, the cultural exchange, the kinds of things that, was, that were discussed in the first half of this program. And the second thing we wanted to do was make a really, really excellent book. So uh, when we set out to make this program, we divided it up in those two parts. And the second half is going to be readings and discussion with contributors from the anthology and then just an open conversation. And for that, I will hand it off to Sasha, and thank you for coming. Thank you, Marty. Yes. Marty Riker is the good spirit of this project, and uh, um, one of the main reasons why I'm doing this is because of Marty. Um, he's one of the few people I can drink down. After He has zero glasses, and I have one, and then I'm drunk. So. Um, the first author, um, I was very uh, happy to um, select his submission, his story for the anthology, Walter Hugo May. It's supposed to be a little more nasal, but um, I'm not nasal enough. <laughs> um, he's a Portuguese writer born in uh, Angola in 1971. Angola was then a Portuguese colony. He grew up in the north of, of Portugal and has lived in Vila do Conde since 1981. This is relevant, I think, because he's not a writer from Lisbon or, uh, or Porto, someone who um, perhaps has a different sensibility. I'm going to ask him about that. He writes poetry, has written a number of books of poetry. He edited poetry anthologies. He translated from Italian and Spanish um, and has um, written a story for this anthology, Dona Malva and Senor Jose Ferreiro which I really, really liked. It's a sort of a ghost story, not a horror story, mind you, an important distinction. Um, he is going to read, however, from an excerpt from his novel, uh, which is published in English? No. Not yet. We hope to, um, that he will have a chance to publish that book in English. So please welcome Walter Hugome from Portugal. Mm. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I'm reading uh, a, a small part of this novel of mine called something like The Workers' Apocalypse. And uh, I'm not reading uh, um, nothing um, included in the anthology because I couldn't um, take anything out that would make sense. I, I felt I was spoiling the text. So I'm just reading the story of two cleaning ladies. <clears throat> Augusto was rolling around on the couch. His stomach hurt. He didn't know that Maria da Graça had put a few drops of cleaning fluid or something other abrasive in his soup. All she did was turn the television down and go to, the, to bed. Staring at the ceiling, she thought of unrelated things. She swore more and more fer fervently that she would spend some time with Quiteria, that she would make her swear by all that was holy never to say anything to anybody. Neighbors that they were, and a week would go by without them seeing each other. It was always like this when August was home. He would relax with a lukewarm beer and fall asleep in the living room, certain that living in Braganza was what was destroying his health. The poor woman didn't want to kill him. She only wanted him, wanted him 
to pay her back a little for her lack of freedom because being married to him was like being on a leash attached to a wall. What was worse, a stupid wall with faded paint, a wall made of stupid opinions. If Augusto died in a few weeks from the cleaning fluid soup, it would be a pleasant surprise, though frightening, because she didn't picture herself a murderer. She got to thinking about this murder business, but she couldn't imagine herself under arrest, stuck in some prison or other. She considered herself to be a woman like any other, and because of, the, of that, anything she did had to be reasonable, given the hard life that was hers to live. Maybe those drops of cleaning fluid were her way of not running away from Augusto, a way of leaving him intact while obliterating some part of him, making him half the man he could be, since Maria da Graça was already sick and tired, sick and tired of the half man that he already was. She had crossed the line and there was no going back. Quiteria gave her the idea, this is how to do it. You can give him up to a liter, a little bit every day. It seems to me that a man who drinks a liter of cleaning fluid will most certainly depart this life. They would laugh, accomplices in their unconscious criminal intent. It was a source of light entertainment drawn from the most enduring and difficult part of life, an entertainment to take the place of their silly adolescent dreams, those times when they had slept with a man out of love, discovering later that love always dies. The effort required to accept the insensitivity of men abandonment or enforced solitude by decree of God's creative will. And later they believed that none of it mattered, that they might as well be made of stone, making their way through the world, observing it without feeling or even interest. And Quiteria would say, shut up, Grasa. You're crazy about the bastard. Your only plan is to go to ruin down there. Meaning that everything in her life would be in jeopardy, in the size, sometimes leaning left and sometimes right, swinging between endless duration and instant depletion, between sweet and sour, between being loved and being deeply hated. Quiteria used to tell her, love that is born this way, for someone you hate, it is the worst kind. It's like fighting against a shadow. Maria da Graça put another drop on cle of cleaning fluid in Augusto's soup and believed she was free of those disgusting feelings. She sought refuge, refuge in the clothes in the clothes lines, shaking out sheets and hanging up even more rugs until her body trembled, her nerves shaken by the horrible idea of falling in love with an old man who despised her, a man she had also learned deeply to despise. Thank you. Thank you, Walter. I noticed that as you were reading, you were conducting uh, yeah, the language. Yeah, it's because of oh. the rhythm. It's, it's really difficult for me to, to read and speak English because I, I really want to, but um, I don't own the words. I, I so don't what know. do you sound to yourself in English? Like, what do you sound to yourself like? like? Uh, um, as if I was not an intelligent being. <laughs> <laughs> I think you have some passing intelligence. Um, last night, I wasn't there, but I heard that... Uh, Walter um, was at a poetry reading, uh, was performing a poetry reading last night, and he sang well, in Portuguese, I assume, rather than English. That's because, like Maria de Graça, I am a bit crazy. But, uh... <laughs> um, let me ask you this. In the, on the map of Portuguese literature, 
Where do you see yourself? What is your position? What is your territory? Uh, well, we are all alone in Portugal. We, do, um, we don't have these um, uh, collectives. We don't identify because we, it's really a small country and you cannot do whatever others are doing. You have to seek for yourself a way of appearing with something different. So I feel like I am, um, how to explain this, I, I really work a lot on the, the, the form. I, I, I don't write with the uh, capital letters, for instance, and well, it's nothing new, but it annoys everyone yet. And um, I don't use many punctuation, and I try to write as, uh, uh, as if it was the text, if it was a, uh, a thought. Because we don't think with capital letters, we don't think with, uh, with uh, dots and uh, commas and uh, all the others, uh, ex exclamation, I don't know the names in English. But uh, that um, formal activity of the text doesn't exist in our minds. So I tend to, to bring the text um, back to its uh, oral, um, mental, free expression. Um, you have published seven books of poetry. You have published three novels. You also four, four novels. My four new novels, one has so. just come oh. out. Oh, um, four novels. You also, in the contributors' note, you, uh, it is written that you dabble in art, and one of your exhibits was entitled "The Face of Gregor Samsa." Gregor yeah. Samsa, of course, being a, a character from Kafka. In the contributors' notes, if I may just read some of the influences that were listed which I find uh, very impressive, is Loban Tunes, Borges, Herzog, Werner Herzog, the film director, David Lynch, Ingrid Bergman, Alfred Hitchcock, Hieronymus Bosch, um, the painter, Bach, Billy Holiday, John Coltrane, Sonic Youth from this neighborhood, Cocteau Twins, Radiohead, Sigur Ross, Anthony and the Johnsons, and so on. In other words, you have a wide range of interests. Uh, in arts, and I would think in the world, what is your primary um, mode? Are you a poet? Are you a novelist? Are you just an artist? I must confess that uh, for 10 years I published only poetry and I, I dreamt all my life um, with the music and poetry and I thought I was going to be a, a great poet from Portugal but then suddenly I had to write this thesis for the university and. I just found myself writing a novel and I was just like amazed how, how had I done it because I thought I began thinking about a, a small prose poem and then it grew, it grew and, and became a, a novel. And, uh, and now with four novels published and I, I really feel that fiction has, uh, has conquered me and I, I, I think I think fiction and I, I see fiction and I don't know how to go back to reality because I think poetry is much more the reality I am. I lost it. One last... <laughs> <laughs> um, well, it might come back. Reality comes back to haunt you usually. Oh what Portuguese writer should we translate? There are you quite a few do. great writers that have been translated, but who should I know, translate? I know that Antonio, Antonio Loeb, when Tunis is already translated, you should read him. He's really, really a major writer. Is for me one of, of the best ever. Um, and um, there's there's this uh, uh, writer that has already died. Uh, he's called Virgilio Ferreira. He lived um, his life in the 20th century, and he was probably the most uh, consensual novelist from Portugal. Um, and uh, he's really amazing. He's uh, he was he created this um, this these stories on on very old people uh, who lived uh, almost uh, all of them alone and who had to deal with the world as if the world was only a few miles uh, he has this amazing story called alegria breve a brief uh, happiness about, about a man who is so far away from everything uh, that one day he, he, his wife dies and he, he cannot go out 
of there, and uh, he just bury her on on the backyard and just waits for the winter to to pass for someone to come and just to be able to say my wife has died and I'm in pain. So this is the kind of uh, stories that Virgilio Ferrer and I think it would be a major thing for him to be translated. All right, well, we'll note that. Thank you, Walter. Thank you. Please give it up for Walter Hugome. Thank you. Our next reader is Naya Marie um, Ait. I practice pronouncing um, our readers' names. She was born and lived until the age of nine in Greenland, which apparently is not all that green. Then her family moved to Copenhagen, um, and now she lives in Brooklyn. And uh, she was she made her readily debut as a as a poet in 1991. She published a book of poetry. She's written plays, children's books, uh, lyrics, song lyrics, and screenplay. And her collection, Babian, which means baboon in Danish, um, was published in a number of countries and received the prestigious Nordic Council's Literature Prize in 2008. Um, her selection, her uh, story in this anthology is, is Bulbjörg. Uh, it's the opening story of the, um, her short story collection, Babian, Baboon. Um, so she'll read that passage. Oh, I mean from that selection. Please welcome Naya Marie Eight. Good afternoon, and thank you for coming. I'm going to read two small segments from this story included in um, the best European fiction. It's called uh, something like, I don't know how to pronounce it in English, actually. In Danish, it's Bulbia. And it, it means, it's, it's not a mountain, um, it's a hill. But we don't have any mountains in, in Denmark, so we, we call the, the hills mountains. But it's a very uh, beautiful place in the northern part of Denmark. We suddenly found ourselves ourselves in an astonishment, astonishing landscape. Luminous white sand hills on all sides, windswept trees twisting beneath the blue open sky. We gasped for breath joyfully as if coming up for air after being too long underwater. We stopped and looked around us, blinking our eyes that had been focused for so long on the gravel road in the darkness of the plantation. Even the smell was different here, salty and fresh. The sea had to be very close now. But we had long lost, we, but we have, sorry, but we had lost our bearings long ago. We were going in a circle. It was hot. We had a six-year-old boy and a dog with us. The bikes were old and rusty. The danger of, the, of a puncture was imminent. We stood completely still and listened. The wind blew through the leaves with a faint rustle. Bird, birds were singing. One was screeching, hoarse and desperate, as if for dear life. Sebastian looked at me anxiously. It's just a common buzzard, nothing to worry about. Come over here, Seba. Would you like a biscuit? You called the boy over, a show of kindness, and I looked back, turning my head too suddenly and too apprehensively. There was the forest we'd just come from, as black and still as a deep lake. The trail in front of us went through what appeared to be a birch grove, and after that there was more of the dense coniferous forest, moss, heather, and fallen tree trunks, grayish black, with broken branches sticking out, sticking out like spikes. We go on in silence. Every time we come to a crossroads, you look at me inquiringly. But after all, I'm not the local here. And each time you end up saying something like, so I think we should go to the right here. I seem to remember that wood pile. Then with another word, we turn, without another word, we turn right until Sebastian throws himself on the ground, yelling and screaming. He's gone into complete hysterics now. He flails at us when we approach him. You try the gentle way, I do it rough. 
In the end, I shake him hard and yell that he'd better relax now, and if not, we'll have to leave him there where he can bawl his eyes out until the buzzard comes and gets him. I regret it, I regret, I regret it immediately and put him down. He cries and holds on to my legs. You're leaning against the stump of a tree. Some ants are crawling up Sebastian's uh, chin, dangerously close to his mouth. What the hell are you doing? I shout at the boy. He hurls himself to the ground with a strident squeal. He spits and sups and hits himself in the face. I have to take off all his clothes to brush off the ants. He kicks and flings his arms and legs. He's been bitten in several places, snots running from his nose. I lift up the naked boy and we stand like that for a while. Now he's just sobbing, nostling his face into my chest. If, you're not riding, if we're not riding in a circle here, we should reach Bullberg at some fucking point. And it's impossible to ride around in a circle here, for Christ's sake, I say. It's impossible to get lost in a shitty little forest like this, I hiss. Anne, I shout. Finally, you've gotten to your feet, your face gray and streaked. You rub your eyes like a child. I know the guy who owns the takeout place over there, you say. What takeout place? I ask, annoyed. The takeout place outside Bullberg, you whisper. I free myself from the child's grip and fling his yellow bag into the shrubbery. I think of how it's still lying there like evidence in the, inv in the investigation of some appalling crime. Someone will stumble over it one day. They'll find my fingerprints on the crossbar and Sebastian's on the handlebars. Perhaps they'll find yours too. Perhaps they'll think that we killed the boy. We'll come back and get your bike another day, I assure Sebastian. He's sitting behind me now, arms around my back, still naked. His legs are dangling, and my fear of getting his foot caught in the wheel annoys me, like a mosquito waiting somewhere in the darkness when you're about to go to sleep. We ride like this for almost an hour. It's muggy. it's about six o'clock, I guess, but none of us actually has a watch. We left home at nine in the morning. It was supposed to be about 15 kilometers between the summer house and Bullberg. We'd wanted to look at the beautiful Ice Age landscape up there. I also wanted to show Sebastian the German bunker. We were supposed to have had a nice little talk about the occupation. Thank you. Thank you, Naya. Oh. Um, <laughs> let me ask you this. What do you sound to yourself like in English? What I what? Well, how do you sound to yourself in English? What do you hear when you read your work in English? You mean when I speak English? Yes, when, when you read this, did you hear your Danish words? No. <laughs> <laughs> I guess it's simple enough. Maybe um, because I really, you know, I try to do it so much in English, so I, yeah. And I think, and I, I think it might have to do with living here now that um, last night I read um, translations of my poetry at the Bowery Poetry Club with Walter and um, and I, I didn't, you know, it was, it was like they were written in English, actually. So I like them as much in English now. It's very interesting how, it, how quickly, I mean, Well, it, it occurred happens. to me while I was listening to you, and um, I, you know, I love your story. That story is told in the, uh, the voice of a man. The narrator is the man. Mm -hmm. That in some ways, this is another way to say that translation is, in, is inherent in literature. You have to become other people to be able to write. Uh, and in some ways, if you're reading or writing in another language, or even in your own language, you always become someone else. Mm -hmm. There's a, a, a kind of loss of, of selfhood. And that could be scary, I would think. Yeah. Do you think you'll be um, writing in English anytime soon, or are you going to stick to Danish? I don't know yet. I, <laughs> I, I mean, my English is not good enough yet to do it, but um, I do feel that I'm starting to dream in English, you know, in, in, when I sleep, so, so maybe one day. Hopefully. You, when you start remembering in English. Yeah, that, yeah. That's the yeah, final exactly. blow, yes. Mm -hmm. um, you also told me in our conversation before that um, since you grew up in Greenland, you were um, 
you were able to speak Greenlandic, mm -hmm. and uh, and that you would like to get it back. You yes, haven't been I in would. Greenland for a while. Because I really lost it. You know, I mean, there's only fifteen. Uh, 50,000 people living in Greenland, so it's kind of difficult to, to, to stick to the language when you're not there. So I lost it very quickly when we moved back to, to Copenhagen, and um, I think it's somewhere in my brain, so I could, I hope I could, you know, find it again. I have a sister living there now, so I should definitely go back, at least. Uh, I would love to hear Greenlandic. I, I wouldn't think it's too different from Danish, but still. Yeah. Um, one of the things in your story that struck me is the, the importance of landscape, the presence mm -hmm, of landscape, mm -hmm. and the story is after all named after a landscape, as it were, uh, uh, topo uh, 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 it's topographic. Um, do you think there is a residue of Greenlandic or Danish landscape in your writing, even if you live in Brooklyn, which would be very much unlike Greenland or even Denmark? You know, it is kind of frustrating right now for me as a writer because I don't know where to situate my stories. And I feel like I'm somehow, you know, lost between two cultures and um, that I don't know New York and New Yorkers well enough to be able to write about it and, um, and that I'm, I'm leaving Denmark at the same time. Denmark is, you know, the distance gets... Um, um, larger every day, so so it's it's kind of. I wrote a, a collection of poetry here, and that was a good way to do it because you know poetry is something completely different, and you don't have to situate it uh, in a special place. So you can actually write about New York, Denmark, Greenland, um, um, Virgin Islands, whatever, at the same time, and. So, and it was very, it, it was a great pleasure. And I could even include English, you know, and use right, both yeah. Greenlandic and English and Danish in the poems. So would you call yourself primarily a poet? Yes, no, have I think pick. I would. I think I would. Um, now, um, it's the same kind of question as they asked Walter. What Danish writer should we translate? Well, I think you have already translated um, the most important one, uh, Inga Christensen. A, a poet, and um, she is, I would say, maybe the greatest writer of Scandinavia for the last decade. And um, other than that, there's this something, there's going a lot of interesting things on in, in Denmark and Scandinavia. And as you were talking about in the beginning, it has a lot to do with um, uh, searching for a national identity and all that. And you know, we have a not very nice uh, political climate in Denmark these years with uh, a lot of racism and stuff. And um, um, there's a lot, but th there's there's a lot of going on, especially I think in in, in Danish poetry um, about identity, about gender, about race. And as we have many um, government um, provided um, grants, you know. Um, the government really supports our language, and it's very small, so they really have to. And um, that is one reason why there is, I think there's, um, you know, the, the underground, or there's so much going on all the time, and it influences even the best-selling novels, because we have so much good literature to, to read. For those of you who are not familiar with soccer, in the finals of the 2006 World Cup, Zidane, Zinedine Zidane, the French, football player and arguably one of the greatest of all time, inexplicably headbutted an Italian player. France and Italy were playing in the finals and was subsequently expelled from the game. And that was his last game in a uh, soccer game, official soccer game. In other words, he ended his career uh, with, uh, with violence and a headbutt. And he's never explained why, and he's never apologized to Materazzi, the, um, the Italian player, Jean-Philippe Toussaint. Um, beautifully wrote about that incredible moment, which goes well beyond, with, whose beauty is going well beyond football. And he's going to read for us from Zidane's Melancholy. Zidane's melancholy. Zidane watched the burning sky, not thinking of anything, 
a white sky flecked with grey clouds lined with blue, one of those windy skies immense and changing of the Flemish painters. Zidane watched the Berlin sky over, over the Olympic Stadium on the evening of the 9th of July, 2006, and felt the sensation with poignant intensity of being there, simply there, in Berlin's Olympic Stadium at this precise moment in time, on the evening of the World Cup final. No doubt, it came down to a question of form, form and melancholy, on the evening of this final. In the first case, pure form. The penalty converted in the seventh minute an indolent Panenka shot that hits the crossbar, paced over the line, and re exerts the goal, a billiard ball trajectory that flirted with Geoff Hurst's fabulous shot at Wembley in 1966. But this was still only a quotation, an inadvertent homage to a legendary World Cup moment. Zidane's true act on the evening of the finale, a sudden gesture like an overflowing of black bile into the lonely night, will only occur later, and then will cause us to forget everything else, the end of the match and the extra time, the shots at the goal and the winners, a decisive, brutal, prosaic, novelistic act, a perfect moment of ambiguity under the Berlin sky, a few dizzying seconds of ambivalence where beauty and blackness, violence and passion came into contact and provoked the short circuit of a wholly unscripted action. Merci. Thank you. Merci. Um, now, first, the obvious question. Um, why Zidane? What, what is it that attracted you to writing about a, a sports figure of, of great renown? It is not um, usually, uh, you know, at the center of literary works, uh, at, at a moment like that. Oui, brièvement, je m'en fous de Zidane. <coughs> to put it briefly, I don't give a damn about Zidane. Mais j'adore le football. But I adore soccer. Comme vous, je suis un fan. Et en 2002 et au Japon, et 2006 en Allemagne, je me suis rendu sur place pour assister à un certain nombre de matchs. And, uh, but I'm a big fan, just like you are. And in 2002, I went to Japan. And 2006, I went to Germany, just so that I could attend a match. J'étais dans le stade à la finale, à Tokyo et à Berlin. Je suis le seul, je suppose, ici. And uh, I, was, um, uh, I was there, I was on the spot for the finals in Tokyo and in Berlin. Probably I'm the only person in this room that was. Bon, alors j'avais trouvé un prétexte pour être présent, c'est que j'ai écrit des textes pour euh, des journaux. And so uh, I was looking for a pretext to write something. I write texts for newspapers. Et mon idée était de, de réunir... Euh, l'ensemble des textes sur le football dans, dans un recueil sur le football. So my idea was that um, I would uh, collect together all of the various pieces I had written um, on soccer and just do an, an ensemble piece on soccer. Et je pensais que le dernier texte serait un texte sur la finale. And I wanted the last text then, that was my idea, to have it be on the final. Mais quand j'ai vu le match, quand j'ai assisté à ce moment incroyable, où, en fait, je n'ai rien vu. Parce que dans le stade, je n'ai pas vu le coup de tête de Zidane. But when I actually saw the match and that uh, unbelievable event took place, I, in fact, didn't see anything. From my position in the stadium, I couldn't see a thing of that unbelievable moment. Et donc, c'est un, un très grand paradoxe d'être présent et de n'avoir rien vu. The big paradox is, I was present, but I saw nothing. Et donc j'ai finalement écrit ce texte, j'ai réfléchi tout l'été, et j'ai écrit ce, ce texte, et après je me suis rendu compte que ce texte seul était plus important 
que l'idée du recueil, et j'ai supprimé tous les autres textes du recueil. Donc le recueil, il est paru, mais il ne fait que 16 pages en français, et c'est « La mélancolie de Zidane ». And so, uh, finally, um, I realized that the important thing was my reflection on the event that had happened, and so I wrote it down. And once I had written down that text, I realized that uh, that was the important thing. That moment was the important text to have written about, and that the rest of the pieces that I had written on uh, soccer were really uh, not up to snuff at all. And so. I threw out the idea of doing a collection, and in fact, the final thing is just 16 pages of this event. Donc, dans l'anthologie, le texte est complet, texte intégral. Vous avez le texte intégral. So, what you've got in this anthology is the entire text that was actually written. Uh, I wish many other writers would be such uh, stern um, self-editors. Um, now. Belgium, of course, is a bilingual country, um, and I would assume that you, you are bilingual, apart from obviously speaking English. Um, how does that influence your writing or your thinking, the constant situation of bilinguality? De la réalité belge Non, comment est-ce que ça a une influence sur vos écrits, le fait d'être dans un bilinguisme constant, le néerlandais et le français En réalité, je n'étais que dans le français. The reality is, I was really in the French mode entirely. Parce que je suis né dans une famille francophone et mes parents ont déménagé à Paris quand j'avais 12 ans. Donc je, je, je suis vraiment euh, complètement dans la, dans la langue française. I was born into a French-speaking uh, family and when I was 12 years old, my family moved to Paris. So I have always been entirely uh, surrounded by a French-speaking world. Comme Colum disait tout à l'heure qu'il était new-yorkais, moi, je suis aussi parisien. Je suis belge et parisien. Uh, just as uh, one of the people that was speaking before uh, referred to himself as having become a New Yorker, I'm a Parisian. I'm truly a Parisian. So you have a particular position in as much as that you, you have a Belgian background, but you are smack in the middle of French literature. Oui, c'est vrai que, en fait, euh, le, la langue est plus importante que la nationalité. Yes, that's true. Uh, in fact, the language is much more important than the nationality. Et que finalement, le, ma famille, si on peut dire, est, est, est plus du côté de mon éditeur en France, les, les éditions de Minuit, euh, que de mes confrères compatriotes belges. And finally, you know, my whole family is in France, but also my, my publisher is Édition de Minuit uh, in mm. Paris. So everything that counts for me is more or less in France. But I think that it's a situation peculiar to Europe or not so peculiar to North America, whereby you can have, you know, a French-speaking um, um, population in, in an entirely different country or a Spanish-speaking population a minority in France. In other words, languages do not respect borders. In North America, you have, you know, there are no Canadian villages on this side of the border. Um, in other words, you can, uh, within the same country, you are involved in situations of translation, which means, leads me to the question, and, and from Um, here on in, I would like to include everyone on the stage. What does Europe mean to you? What does European literature mean to you, if anything? C'est moi qui commence, ou il a dit que tout le monde pouvait répondre? Je commence? Jean-Philippe is asking if he should be the person to begin. Yes, go ahead. C'est vrai que n'ayant pas beaucoup de sens de la nation, parce que le fait d'être belge ne, ne, ne suppose pas une, une, le poids d'une nation, on se sent très naturellement européen. It's true that um, as a Belgian, you don't have much of a sense of a nation. You don't feel the weight of a nation as you might from uh, some um, other European countries, and so it's very easy to feel as though one is a European from Belgium. Et c'est vrai que aussi le, le fait d'avoir vécu à, à Madrid, d'avoir vécu à Berlin d'avoir vécu à Paris, d'avoir vécu à Bruxelles, je me sens en fait chez moi partout en Europe, mais se sentir chez soi partout, c'est un peu se sentir chez soi nulle part. And so the fact also, in my case, of having lived in Madrid, Berlin, Brussels, uh, Paris, I feel at home everywhere, but you might also say that by the same token, I feel at home nowhere. Um, Naya What does Europe mean to you? What, what does European literature mean to you, if anything? 
Well, the thing about Europe, Europe is that, and, and, and you know, when, when you're in America, you don't think of that so much, but it is really lots and lots of very small countries separated deeply by languages. And um, of course, I read all the classics. I read Joyce and, you know, um, Celine, everything, but, um, and it was translated, but there is a huge lack of translations within Europe. And especially when it comes to Eastern European literature, it's almost impossible to, to read in, in at least um, any Scandinavian language. And also I think for, you know, some of us in, in Scandinavia or, or the, the, the generations before us mostly um, were able to read in, in French and German and English too. But now uh, English is everything. And in a weird way, if I wanted to read, for instance, uh, Walter's poetry, I should um, get it in London, probably. <laughs> so, you know, it is difficult to actually to find out what's going on in Greece, what's going on in uh, Romania. Um, right now, you have to, to look out for literary magazines and, um, and buy your books on Amazon. <laughs> Yeah, well, we might all end up doing that. Yeah. Uh, Walter, what does Europe mean to you? What does European literature mean to you? Um, as Naya said, um, it's really difficult for us to, to read each other because the languages are so different that we cannot understand each other. We have to, we have to use always English or French or sometimes Spanish to, to do the translation. And in Portugal, we have this, um, this strange feeling because we, are, we can be seen as the first or the last country in Europe because we are really uh, uh, almost outside. And uh, I was, I was uh, now invited by the European Union to participate in this project in, uh, with several poets, one for each country, to write a poem about the idea of Europe in our countries. And I remember uh, of me uh, being a kid and playing just next to the border and we could not uh, cross the border because it was, it was not yet created, uh, have cre was, whoa. European the Union. European Union was not created yet and uh, we could not go there. And uh, we as, as the children, uh, as kids, we just look for the, the trees and imagine the world outside and had this perfect idea, very uh, objective idea that Europe was outside, would begin uh, after the trees, so we were something else. And this idea, this is the, the, the idea that uh, I think the most of the people in Portugal have. Uh, in, and this means that I suppose this, this can happen in all of the countries or in many countries also, the, the, the ones that are not in the middle. And, uh, and this begins with this uh, difficulty of us to, uh, to um, just mix with, uh, with the others. We are really different and, and, and because of the languages we stay somehow, we stay alone, you know. Um, along those lines, Naya mentioned that English beca became a kind of a clearing house for many European literatures. And, you know, there's a fear in many parts of Europe that English is taking over and contaminating local languages. At the same time, uh, the English language allows for an anthology like this because it is big enough, as it were, to cover a lot of ground. What is your um, take on that? What do you think of the possible dominance of the English language in, in contemporary global culture? Oh, juste une petite phrase. Elle, elle disait qu'elle espérait rêver en anglais. Moi, j'ai un peu peur de faire des cauchemars en anglais. Just a little word. Um, um, our colleague to the left was saying that uh, she was dreaming in English and hoping to dream in English. I, I'm afraid of having nightmares in English. <laughs> what about you, Naya? What do you think? What is, what is English doing to other languages in Europe and um, the literatures in Europe? Four or two, two well, well, in a way, I mean, it's, it's difficult for me to talk about because I'm, I'm in the middle of English, but, but um, 
Unfortunately, it seems like English is the language, I mean, within Europe. And, and it means that you're not, in, in Denmark, for instance, you don't, as, as, a, as a pupil, in, in, pupil in, in school, you don't have a student, you don't have um, German and French anymore. And we used to do that when I was a child. So it's like, and, and when, you, when you have to defend your master in university, you'll have to do it in English, even if there's only Danes around, you know? So it is really, so, so I think it's very important um, that the governments really, you know, support the languages because they're going to disappear otherwise. And I think uh, it's interesting what, what, what uh, Walter just said because it's, it's completely the same in Denmark. You know, Europe is outside of our borders and we are a very special nation, very special um, um, people, which we're not. And, um, and there's this feeling of, of being isolated and also at the same time, maybe this illusion of not being connected, you know, illusion of not being connected, um, even if we are. I mean, uh, history and, and the um, um, European Union and everything connects us, but it's, everybody has this, this struggle to find a national identity, which is in a way crazy, I mean, and especially when I really realized that when I moved here, because as you were talking about in the first part of this event, that, that what is national identity? Is it, does it matter? I mean, the language matters, the nature you grew out of matters, and maybe that's it, you know? Europe is in some ways always elsewhere, never here. Um, what is your take on the possible dominance or the idea of the dominance of the English language? Um, well, I... I I should uh, know how to speak French very well because I studied it. I didn't study English, but I saw uh, too many pictures by Woody Allen. <laughs> so um, I think we have always to, to be open to foreign languages. If you don't learn, if you are not willing to understand foreign languages, you are uh, closing yourself to a certain uh, uh, size, you, you are not growing. Uh, the, the, the philosopher Jacques Derrida he said that some languages, uh, people are, their identity and their, and their character, personality, is also made by the language they, they talk and the way they talk the language. For instance, we Portuguese are very different from the Brazilian and we all speak Portuguese. And you can just, if you listen to the sound of a Brazilian person speaking, uh, you can understand immediately the, the fundamental, the essential difference between us. We are close, we, are, uh, we have this melancholy way of, uh, I don't know what, we lost. We were 500 years ago, we had this major history, and we feel that, uh, that we have five centuries of losing and losing and losing. And the Brazilians are, are the opposite. They are gaining and gaining and gaining. So their Portuguese is happy and open and, well, it's different. And Derrida also says that, for instance, in Portugal, we have this word that is saudade. It's a very well-known word because, they, well, it, only us have this word. And so that is a, a mix. It's, it's something like missing a person or something with a melancholy way, but also it, it may be a happy thing. And uh, this is a, a complex uh, word and, uh, and, and it has it all inside. For instance, uh, I can say that my father has died 10 years ago and now I miss him, but this, this lack is also, can bring me also joy because the, the, I can celebrate his life and I can celebrate, remember him. So this is, this, all of this is uh, in Portuguese, so that we say so that and, and people immediately understand. Jacques Derrida says that if you, if you have this, uh, this kind of words that say such a specific uh, sentiment, uh, then you can feel, then you can feel it. You can feel the word and you can reach this sentiment. If you don't have, perhaps you don't, you cannot feel this. So this is only done you can only achieve to this growing, I don't know, humanity if you confront the languages and if you 
try to translate, to, to receive from, from others what they have discovered that, that your language and your people have, have has not discovered yet. At the same time, I think there's a word in Bosnian, sevdah, which pretty much describes the same feeling as sodat. In other oh. words, translation, the project of translation has to match up those feelings. You have yeah. to find, look for equivalents, and if you can't find them, that is then lost in poetry. But what you can find is what is gained in poetry. Yeah. Uh, um, Colm, do you have any questions you would like to ask our readers? Uh, well, I, you know, I was thinking about the, 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 the notion that um, maybe being European is um, saying that we actually matter. Because uh, in, 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 in many ways, like certainly if, um, in Ireland, uh, we could just be on, on the edge circling around. But if we say we're both Irish and European, at the same time, it gives us a sense that there's something um, that we're, we're a larger part of. And, and, and it strikes me that when I look at this anthology, and it really is a fantastic, you should, like, you should get this anthology and read it, that, um, that these people are, are here saying that we matter, right? But this nationality may not matter so much as what we need to say. And finding the, finding the proper way to say it uh, and that the larger question or statement is that fiction matters. And, and I wonder if that is a dialogue, say, for example, in France, I mean, um, the idea that, that, that the, the writing really matters to your projection of what it means to be French or sort of all around the world, but certainly, say, in relation to the United States. Um, so. Is, is there a lot of dialogue about the importance of fiction, the importance of uh, the literary moment? In French? In French and, 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 and in Portugal. And Oui, je répondrai pas directement, mais, mais je crois que finalement la, la, la littérature, paradoxalement, est, est uniquement une question de langue, mais, mais finalement, elle transcende la question des langues parce qu'il s'agit quand même d'un dialogue très intime entre deux êtres humains, l'écrivain et le lecteur. I'll answer, I'll answer in somewhat of an uh, indirect uh, way. I think that finally, literature contains within it a paradox uh, right at the center. Uh, the essential thing is language. It is, it is uniquely and solely language, and yet literature has to transcend language, because finally what literature is, is an intimate dialogue between the writer and the reader. Naya? Yeah, I agree. I really agree. And, you know, well, as every language has its own expression, just as... Um, uh, Valda was talking about before, and and I was just thinking about what it would be like for me to write in English, for instance. And I really think I should stick to Danish, you know, <laughs> and 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 get a good translator because it is, you know, in in Denmark, in Danish, if you say the word uh, milk and you say it, it's milk, and when I think about the word milk or milk, it, you know, it it makes my heart, you know go crazy when I think about milk because it has to do with my mom and it has to do with lots of very intimate um, things. So, and, and, and maybe that's the difference, you know, the difference between milk and milk in your own language. In Chicago, people say milk too. <laughs> I don't know if it's Danish influence. Walter? I, I agree with them, yeah. Well, on this agreement, I would like to open um, um, <laughs> Are this, are can, can I just add something, sure. not really answer something? Uh, because I would like to say that in, in my perspective from Portugal, I understand this anthology as a major importance also for us in, in, in Europe, because um, this has never been done in Europe. Of course, we have lots of anthologies of uh, supposedly it would be the, the new uh, fiction in uh, Czech Republic or France or Spain or something, but um, we we don't have this uh, guide, this complete guide to uh, new um, uh, European fiction, 
And uh, I think this, uh, this, this must be a book also known there because it will be such a, 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 a privileged way to get, for us to get to know each other because of, because of this uh, question about the languages and this sense of being alone every, every, every time. So this really, uh, that I, was, um, I really wanted you to, um, to understand this idea that this is not something that is happening here in the United States. This is happening everywhere. This anthology is really happening everywhere. So I'm really glad this is a way of also saying thanks to Alexander and Dalki Archive, of course. Thank you. Obviously, without the writers, all this you know, is impossible entirely, and without the readers. So I would like to open up um, this event to the audience. If you have any questions, please do ask them. And um, there's a microphone that you should use when asking questions so everyone can hear you, and also because all this is being recorded and sent to the Swedish Academy. There's a lady with, a, with her hand up. Good afternoon. I haven't read the anthology yet, um, but I look forward to it. I have two questions. Um, it was mentioned earlier that the American literary community is little insular, but don't you think that um, the community is influenced positively by the number of immigrant writers or uh, writers in exile from their own country? Um, and also, have you received backlash from countries who openly oppress their artists or writers who have been uh, included in your anthology? Um, no, I, as of now, we, we did not put any of our writers in trouble, so, uh, <laughs> which is good news. And we also have, you know, but we try to protect them. We threaten I, the governments. I think it's important to say that, 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 that we didn't say that the American liter literary community is, is, is insular. In fact, um, quite the opposite, that, that, that the American literary community absorbs extraordinarily well. And, and allows people to hold on to their nationality as, and, and become um, American um, at the same time. So there is this paradox between the fact that we don't translate enough, uh, and so the, the publishing community doesn't seem to want to translate uh, or to get the books out there. But at the same time, there is a, a, a very positive aspect in the American literary, literary com community that's generous. And, and, and decent and, and is openly uh, wants to know about the other. Um, but on a business level, I think that it doesn't seem to work. Another way to put it is that the American uh, literature, literary community accepts writers, but not necessarily languages. Right. And, and, that's, and we need languages. Not just writers is not enough. I mean, I write in Bosnian and in English, but, but it's entirely different. Um, and so I know, and I read obviously Bosnian, it's entirely different if you read me or someone who was written in Bosnian and who might be living in Bosnia, but not necessarily, uh, because what, uh, in, the, in the spirit of what Walter was talking about, what languages bring into the English language, what other languages bring into the English language, to the process of translation cannot be replicated by um, or induced by writing in English. It has to come from the language itself. I wonder what you think about it, our guests. I, I, can I? Yeah. I was amazed when, the, when you said uh, uh, before that uh, perhaps only 3% of the books were translated because in Portugal, I, I know for sure that uh, at least 50% of the books are translation, the translations. And if you talk about fiction, I, I'm sure that it goes up to 80%. And uh, we always have this uh, kind of uh, euphoria to know what, what's going on outside in the, in the whole world. So, we always try to translate into uh, get to know. Uh, um, Naya has already said that, and you also, that uh, we grow up reading Chekhov and Dostoevsky and then crossing the borders without this idea, having the idea of being crossing the borders of reading the, the French Baudelaire and Verlaine, uh, L'Autre Amont, my, my favorite one. And, um, well, and uh, I lost myself. Uh, <laughs> you in New York. <laughs> yeah, but th that's, that's the idea that I, I really understand, I, I, and I grew up understanding literature as this uh, open way and receiving, the idea of receiving uh, from, from outside, from other languages and other cultures. 
everything, and not really from, from the, the, the boy next door. Uh, Just to give you an idea um, in support of what Walter was saying, that um, a country like Slovenia, which has about two million people, uh, publishes the same number of translations a year, about 350, as the United States, um, which, is, which amounts to about 55% of their uh, literary production, I mean publications of books published. Is there anything this, you would like to add? This should be a question for them. Yeah. How come you don't read the translated books? They are reading. Uh, they're, they're here. They're, these are the good guys. Yeah. Yeah. Here, here we're preaching to, to, to the converted, right? Yeah, someone has a question over there. Yes. Uh, it's working. Anyway, um, I wanted to thank uh, Maya for what she said uh, about the emotional Nine. content of the word in your own language. This was really profound, and it really gets to the heart of it. Uh, if everything is written in English, then that emotional content is lost. And uh, I went to the translation slam last night, and translation is, a, is difficult, too, to get the original uh, idea. But I think as an American, uh, growing up in the Midwest, for example, but I've lived here for over 30 years, uh, these books just weren't available. We wanted them, but they just weren't out there. And um, I think it has to do with, if I were living in a smaller country, I would feel... Um, as a, in, in the literary community of that country that I, that I would have to translate in order to know what's going on in the rest of the world, but in a country this big physically, if you're in the middle of the country, you know, you, it's, you're so far away from those other cultures. You may be curious about them, but how do you get there? You, you take a trip for, for two weeks and you come back. So I think that um, it, it's a, if, if we're in New York, it's great. You know, you, you've got all kinds of cultures and everything. But if you're out there in the middle of Wyoming or whatever, and you're one of the few people who's interested in other cultures, then you, then you really have a problem. And hopefully uh, more, more translations will get out that way. Well, the, the internet reaches Wyoming. I was, I was there recently, and now <laughs> it has just reached it. Um, but this is an interesting question. Maybe with this we can close because I only have a few minutes for, for our guests. The internet, what can it do for translation in this situation of communication between languages and, uh, and literatures? Does it, is it doing anything to help the cause, or is it marring the cause, or it doesn't matter at all? I think it helps a lot, actually, because, I mean, all the blogging, and even if, if you find, you know, you can, be, you can be lucky enough to find just one poem translated into a language that you can actually read, and then you, 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 then you know he's or her is there, and you can find more and stuff. So it's a, it's a very good way to, it's, it's very confusing, but it's a good way to, I think. Mm -hmm. Oui, tous les moyens sont bons pour faire venir un lecteur à un livre. Il n'y a pas lieu d'être particulièrement pessimiste, même si aux états unis il n'y a pas beaucoup de traductions. Euh, Ce n'est pas une question de quantité, c'est une question de qualité. Il suffit d'avoir un très bon lecteur, ça peut être satisfaisant. I think that uh, all roads are good as long as they lead you to, uh, to literature, so internet or, or whatever. And I find also no reason to be uh, pessimistic just because there are not immense quantities of, let's say, translations coming into the United States. It's not a question of quantity. It's a question of quality, and one great book can make that difference to you. Un, un seul lecteur. And even one oui, single reader. L'écrivain n'a besoin que, que d'un lecteur à la fois. A writer really needs only um, one writer, or one reader at a time. I think I think uh, we, we cannot trust the internet, but uh, uh, of, of course we have to use it, and I use it a lot. Uh, and to translate, for instance, is it's a great uh, machine because you can put the word, you can Google the word, you can seek for images, and you can actually. See, and even if you, if you, if it's a slang or anything, everything on, is in, a, is on the internet nowadays. So you have to be careful. You have to really um, try to, to to contain yourself. But it's a, a nice uh, or a good way to um, to start. I think um, we have run out of time. Unfortunately, this conversation could go on well beyond our allotted uh, time. But the conversation will continue uh, between writers and readers if you pick up the anthology and if you look for the writings of our guests. Uh, and I would like you to join me in thanking them for their presence here and for their writing. Walter Hugo May.
Naya Marie Ait and Jean-Philippe Toussaint and Colin McCann. Thank you very much.